Click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two-time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing. Three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing, episode 105. And we're up at Oliver's Mount, Scarborough, and we're delighted to be joined by Stavros. Uh, welcome to the podcast. How how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm impressed that you know I'm Stavros actually, because that was sort of a name that came out in the seventies, I guess you'd say. Um, and you know, ironically, I get these messages from people in Greece and places. They think I'm Greek, um, and and a lot of people would be wondering why the hell I'm called Stavros. And it was Barry Sheen because if you knew Barry, you had to have a nickname. Everyone had a nickname. And he found out when I was a kid, and I was about, I don't know, 12, 13 years old, and I was a proper little fat bastard. Can I say that? Sorry. Of course you can. Yeah, Anything right, okay. you bloody want. To. Right, okay. <laughs> bloody great. Um, I was a fat little porker, and I had long, curly hair, and there was a program called Kojak, and on Kojak was this fat bloke with curly hair called Savros, and that's where it came from. Wow. And I've sort of stuck with it now, and, and I get all these weird kind of pe- people thinking I'm, I'm Greek, but I'm not. I'm very much very British, born and bred in Cambridgeshire, um, and sort of the old guys know I'm Stavros and how did you know I'm Stavros I guess from my Twitter site or something like yeah, that yeah Twitter at Stavros 6 isn't that's it that's it it but, is uh, yeah, yeah just of years, years of seeing you know gone commentary and mm. whatever Go and what, what is the most creative name you had for another rider than Barry what was his most um, out there one what the most creative nickname? Yeah. Well, most of the most, <laughs> most insulting ones. Um, well, it was Will Hartog's girlfriend because he didn't like Will Hartog because he beat him at one time at Aston. So his girlfriend was known because she got big knockers. She was known as Titsabel. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, <laughs> I think her name was Isabel, but she was known as Titsabel. I wonder, I wonder if she's walking around the place now, Gun, you know, I've still got it. I've yeah, still yeah. Titsabel, yeah, you know. Qu- quite, quite possibly she is. But Will Hartog's still walking around, and, uh, and I do see him on a regular basis, and he still gets in his same leathers that he rode in 19... 19- 79 or 80 or whatever he is and um and still just to say he hasn't changed a great deal which is rather annoying but so yeah there was an awful lot of nastiness sort of you know backbiting that goes on and everyone had odd names it was great yeah do you think the sport lacks that now in a way because uh, you know that playful playboy attitude back then it was absolutely mint everyone wanted to be a part of it yeah i think it probably does but it's so much harder now isn't it for people to be what i call themselves normal set themselves because of social media and everything else and you get so much stick don't you from saying the wrong thing and oh i can't believe that you said this and you did that and everything else and you know i use social media because you kind of in my job you have to because yes. you're, you're promoting things like my shows and so on and so on but i have to be so careful i have to have it vetted by my wife actually if i'm <laughs> To say something she has to have a look at it to make sure i've not pissed anyone off you've, you've just got to be so careful especially in today's uh, it's like sort of cancel culture as well because the right now you can well, I like that chrissy you know people, well, p- people are getting cancelled from things they've said or joked yeah. about 10 yeah. 15 years yeah. ago and it's it's very difficult i mean obviously everyone makes mistakes and like recently yeah. uh, shaky's had a real hard time yeah, yeah, from sure. something that which happens. was so absurd ridiculous absolutely ridiculous i mean in my day you didn't get that you just went to prison <laughs> straight up straight off straight in Stavros straight in there you yeah. little it, it is isn't it and it's, it is and it's difficult and, and you know I don't think anybody certainly in, in our sport of motorcycle racing wants to be uh, harmful to anyone they don't mean any malice but it's just so easy to to make a mistake and upset someone because there's a, we're in a sort of blameless culture aren't we and there's so many people that are upset with the wrong way you say something and and it's difficult it really is and I, I feel very sorry for some of the really really high profile it's like we've spoken about watch her back aren't they because mm. people are digging up bones now aren't they like the, yeah. the shaky we've, incident we've yeah. spoke about this before yeah. about uh, Lorenzo all the way through his career who was kind of this robot that mm. sort of to me just didn't seem to have any personality as soon as he's walked away from the sport yeah. he's like he's hilarious and he's got opinions on everything yeah. and it's just what a shame that he, he wasn't able to like express himself when he was a you know star of MotoGP uh, yeah absolutely and probably he was so wrapped in wrapped up in being that star that he never got round to it but it does seem now he's just putting the knife in and twisting it wherever he can which, <laughs> which I think we all love don't we yeah, yeah. of course it's, yeah, no, it's, it's perfect but he's getting slated and slandered and everything else entertainment and I, I'll never forget I, I think it was 2012 maybe 13 I was working for BBC um, and I remember 
And I thought after I said it, I just said, you know, it's a great shame Valentino Rossi is my hero, he's the GOAT and this, that, that. And I think it must be in 2013. I said, but I really don't think he's going to win another Grand Prix. And I got death threats. I seriously, we know where you live. We're going to come and get you and this, that, and that. And, and I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but he hasn't won a race since then. And, and why should he? Because all these young kids are coming along. He's, what, 42 years old. Um, but uh, And I have the greatest respect for him. But I, all I said was what I felt and what yeah, I wanted to say. I wanted to put it out. But there's so many people that daren't say it nowadays. Mm -hmm. You get this kind of uh, situation where everyone's blowing smoke everyone else's arse. And they daren't actually say what they actually want to mm -hmm. say. And it's a bit of a worry. And we're here at Oliver's Mound for, it's the first of four meetings this year. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, the Saturday night, so there's been a bit of racing today, and uh, obviously we've got a, another race day tomorrow. You're here working for ITV on the sort of TV job. Mm. Is that um, is that your sort of main sort of line of work at the moment? I uh, I still struggle to say that name of work. Um, I've never really had a proper job. It depends so. on how many zeros are on the yeah, end of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can be persuaded. Um, yeah, it, it is really. I, you know, again, I had a great career racing motorcycles, and then I had a good time running racing teams with Rob Mack and people we've been speaking about with the Loctite Yamaha team, which went on for five or six years, winning lots of British championships, and then uh, truck racing came along. And it was always Barry Sheen that said, if I fell in a cesspit, I'd come up with a salmon on my head. And and he's probably right, because I've had a charmed life, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> Who told him that, Satan? I have never. Know. <laughs> Haven't you heard that one? All right. No, 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 right. no, 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 that's, that's me, yeah. So. But I have had a charmed life. So truck racing came along. I did that till 2001 or two. And then the BBC contract came along for me to go off and do commentating for World Superbikes and British Superbikes and so on and so on. Um, and I still very much involved with all that type of thing. But I, I was able and probably this is where my career maybe went a, a bit wrong because I was always looking at plan B. I am a sort of belt and braces person. So over the period of time, I bought quite a few houses and I've got that little business that goes on renting houses out. I work as an accident investigator for motorcycle and road racing accidents as well for insurance companies. So I would be the person if an accident happens and somebody's blaming someone else and there's two people fighting over it and there's a claim going on, then I go along and actually sit down, write a report as to actually how it did happen because the listeners and lawyers and judges have no idea. Oh um, my God, that's so, a bit heavy mind, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is quite it, heavy. And, it, and some of the things are pretty horrible that go on and there's there's always a claim, isn't there? Because uh, if you arrive in hospital on the back of the appointment card, it says, have you had an accident? Well, yes, because that's why I'm bloody here. Of course, yeah. And then it's no win, no fee solicitors wanting to sue the circuit or whoever it might be because they fell off their motorbike. Um, so it's something that's kind of hidden away, but actually it does go on. That is why your racing license costs so much money. Mm. Um, and, and every other insurance costs so much money because of the, the claims that go on. And it isn't just whiplash on the road, it happens on racetracks. Are, are you still involved with, I've, I've been to a few of your mad tours, are you still doing those? Yep, I am, I would have been. I haven't for the last year and a half, simply because of COVID, but we're planning to run three at the end of the year in October, and then kick off again in 2022. Remind us what mad, Stands Mad stands for my adolescent dad because so. my daughter was hosting it, <laughs> uh, and I feel very sorry for my kids because they still can't believe that I'm such a childish, pathetic idiot. How, um, many, how many kids do you have? I've got two. Yeah, two that I'm owning up to. Um, yeah. <laughs> Good uh, luck. Yeah. Speaking, speaking of which, uh, I'm, I'm not a massive fan in general of private uh, number plates, but I've got to say yours is by far the best one I've ever seen. What, well, the one out here? Yeah. I've, I know I had a better one than I've that. Seen, yeah, I yeah, know your other yeah, one, but have, one, you, have yeah. you seen the one no, outside? No, how are you? Go on. Yeah. Well, it's, well, some people think it looks like cock, but it actually is 60 CK. Um, and Come on, how are you? you purposely went for it because it looked like cock, well it matched pen one pen one five that i used to own which which actually some people thought looked like penis get, um, and i only bought them to stop my wife driving my cars around yeah, yeah. has it worked yeah yeah well i got rid of the wife so i don't really need the numbers anymore um, yeah. you can have that there yeah, 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 you can, they're, they're, actually i did sell pen 15 after i got rid of the first wife and what i do now to cheer myself up i put the wedding video on backwards and what you're getting a car and piss off <laughs> <laughs> how do you uh, oh how do you go about getting something like that? Is there must be a pri like a private market for those? There is. Uh, there's just a price on them. You just pay what you think it's worth. And, how um, much did you pay for it? Well, the Pen 15 I actually bought in 19 
it would have been 87 when I had 28, 80, and I, I actually paid 10,000 pounds for it and I sold it for 75. Yeah, I like so that. it's a good, an investment, good, good investment, really, yeah. yeah, yeah. What about Who has that kind of money to go in our lot? This well, some needs, prick, needs, I guess, some prick, yeah. Some massive yeah. prick with a lot of it. That, yeah. that's, that's, but it's fun, isn't it? I used to love mean. the fact that people would laugh and get, the, the odd person gets upset and the same with my 6-0-CK, but quite honestly, life's about giggling. It's not well, yeah, upsetting anyone, it is. is it? You know, that's a flipping chicken, a cock, isn't it? Of course it is, but yeah. I'll tell and you what, you are Sorry, do you know when you think about uh, like money, like say if you'd kept that 10 grand in the bank, it would, with a bit of investment, yeah. with a bit of interest, it would be 11, 12 grand. Yeah, yeah, sure. But you've had the enjoyment of <sighs> the, the humour been, of the yeah, humor of it. Absolutely. And it's, I've had the fun, the giggles and the laughs that come with it. And, um, you know, I can sell it to any old prick afterwards. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, at that time, you've got a, you're a, man, a businessman, you've got your head screwed on. Did you honestly buy that? And potentially at any no, moment in your mind think this could make money in the future i would no, never no. ever would have thought about that That's no I, I actually didn't but as time went by you start mm. looking at different numbers and what goes up and what doesn't um and it's sort of you know it's a it's a very cheap investment because the trouble That's is you class. you you kind of it doesn't cost a lot to keep it that's the the, the difference if you buy most things you buy a house it's going to go up but you've got to put a new roof on it and new shower you need time, so time, on and so time, on yeah. time but yeah number plates i recommend them if you buy the right one yeah well, obviously you're a man who knows this business very well what is the most expensive number plate out there there i think it was something, something like rr1 or something like rolls royce one or something but you're constantly going for three four hundred thousand pounds really really top end number plates incredible wow. yeah. But then all our listeners will be going, oh, yeah, tell you what, yeah. get the DVLA website yeah, yeah, chugged yeah. up there, love yeah, that. Let's have yeah, a look at this. Sure, sure, sure. That's In fact, there was there is a number out there now which is PAR fifteen H, which looks like parish, albeit that I've got two R's. And I couldn't afford that, but I just put it on my car back in the day. <laughs> Getting a speeding ticket. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, that, I never got a parking is... ticket or a speeding ticket, but I like the number, so I used it. But that was back in my childhood. Oh God! Back in my youth. So, I, 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 I was about to say. I tell you what. This this crack is so good, and I think we're gonna have to go straight back to the beginning. Like we're gonna have to. We always go through like the timeline of a right. a rider's career. So what what actually got you into bikes? Then um, there was no kind of uh, plan at all. I was as a kid uh, at the age of probably about. 11, 12, 13, I got invited mm. to ride a bike with a, from a friend that lived near me. I live in the countryside near Cambridge. Uh, my poor old dad popped off when I was 13, so he didn't have a lot of chance to kind of reform me in any which way. I was a bit, oh, of, a loose, bit of a loose cannon. And I loved riding motorbikes, and there was a disused airfield nearby, and I got a BSA Bantam, and then I got a James or whatever it would have been. Anything I could buy for five quid or 10 quid. Uh, I just kept riding around the fields, loved it to bits. When I was 16, I got a road bike was a lunatic as lots of 16 year olds were <laughs> bearing in mind back then you didn't have to wear a crash helmet even so you'd be bombing around the Sugar villages man. no absolutely i think the helmet law came in in would have been about 68 or 9 or something like that so anyway i'm, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting opposite but obviously investing your money in number plates keeps you young because you do not look that old that um, time. <laughs> all right well i'm now uh, black and white band, I'm, I'm, I'm 68 now which is actually my favorite number because you know that's why they suck yours and you are on one but uh, <laughs> no, I'm um so but yeah uh, <laughs> Calm down, lads. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I was riding my bikes around the fields and everything else. Had a road bike, was a lunatic on the road, but then got fed up with not being able to get girlfriends because they wanted you to have a car. So I had a car for a couple of years. And then it would have been when I was about 18, some of my mates just said, let's go have a race team. And we went to a pub, a local pub called the uh, Wagon and Horses or something. And there was a guy that did machining engineering. There was someone did paint spraying. There was someone that was quite good at kind of um, doing all the paperwork and everything else. And they're going, well, who should we get to ride it? The bike. And we built this old Triton, Triumph engine, Norton frame. And they all pointed to me because I was the biggest lunatic on the road. We went to Brands Hatch with this Triton just as a giggle. Uh, and it all fell apart and there was oil all around. Brands is still slippery from the bike I rode there in 1978, I think it was. 76, actually. Um, so that was it. It was just fun. Absolutely, as we probably most of us start out having a giggle. And it was having riding motorbikes, the giggle going to Brands Hatch in your van, the pub at night and so on and so on. And it just was that. And then we decided that it might be best to buy a better bike than we built. <laughs> and I bought a 250 TD2B Yamaha, which I've literally just bought back in the last six months. So I've now got the bike that I rode in 19, 
73. Exactly. So you, exact bike. Yeah. Wow, yeah. how on earth did you trace that? Because someone found me with it. Uh, you know, they knew it was mine because it got my name, initial stamped on it and so on. They tracked it all the way through. So they knew that this silly sucker would pay 13 grand for it. So I just have for an old TD2B Yamaha. Uh, was that the two, a two stroke, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, so what was it like? Be it like so you've gone from your big heavy four strokes, you mm. know, and obviously yeah. I know you're from your two stroke mm. years. So mm. how was that transition for oh, you? Did well, it? the two stroke was so fast, so yeah. light, so easy. It had proper brakes on it. They had a great big <laughs> four leading shoe brake on it. And I went off to Snetterton and Brands and Cadwell and won lots of races, all the club races. I won the Bemsey Championship and the New Market and District. And so then it starts to get a little more serious because you start winning and you think, maybe I shouldn't have that six pint, you know, on Saturday night at the Snetterton. <laughs> I'll stick with five. <laughs> yeah. And it got slightly more serious. And then even more serious, I'm in the paddock at Snetterton, I think it was, and a lad, uh, not a lad, an old gentleman called Harold Coppock came along and said, I've watched you on your old TD2B. Uh, I think you can do better. And he bought me a TZ 250 and a 350, and I did. I went on to win some national races. And then another sponsor came along, a builder from Guildford called Dave Moore. He bought me an RG 500, and then that was the best bike you could have at the time. I started beating some of the factory riders, John Newbold, John Williams, who were Barry Sheen's teammates at the time. Um, and it was a shoe in because I met Barry and he wanted me to be his teammate because we got on really well. And I was a factory Suzuki rider. And it in all that sort space of, of time. In that space of time, in, in a period of three years, I'm a club rider, Shut sort up. of national riders, then I'm a factory Grand Prix rider. What was your first introduction to Barry? Sna uh, Brands Hatch, they used to have an event, I don't know if it still goes on, it was called Stars of Tomorrow. And it was an, in an event, the club race type national event where you went along and they had a panel of judges and it was something like Paul Dunst or Barry Sheen and I can't remember who it was. And there was a panel and I went out and I won the 250 race, I won the 350 race on my 250 and finished second in the open class. Anyway, I came in and, and thinking I probably should have done all right and they ended up putting me as second. I was a bit pissed off to be quite honest. Anyway, Barry Sheen comes over to me and he said, I've voted for you to be first, I've watched you and this, that and the other. And I thought what a nice man was. What I didn't know, and I found out afterwards, he fancied my girlfriend. So that was the only reason he came over to talk to me, <laughs> I think, possibly. So, but we worked out that he lived up the road for me in Cambridgeshire at the time, and we got together riding trials bikes and motocross bikes and things like that. And all of a sudden, I'm mates with Barry Sheen. So that was another kind of tick in the uh, uh, a tick in the box, really. And we just hit it off from that point on, really. Uh, he never went off with my girlfriend and I never went oh, was off that, with his. That was my next question, Chrissy. I, 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 I can see it like, in your eyes. I, I can even go. <laughs> well, she said she didn't, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Watching that in years yeah. to come, you know that interview you did with Chase and the Racing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I heard it. I heard it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I rolled him. I rolled him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was yeah, that was my first introduction to him, and we got on really well. And I was beating his teammates at the time on my private bike, so I ended up being the factory Suzuki rider in '77, and then got fired at the end of that year for falling off while leading the British Grand Prix. You got fired for leading it, and then fell well, off. Well, I had a, I finished fifth in the World Championship that year, which was my first ever year, and I didn't know any of the tracks, so it was okay. But um, Suzuki's cut back, and Pat Hennan was there was seventy seven. There was Barry Sheen, Pat Hennan, myself in the factory team, and Pat Hennan ended up third in the championship, and I was fifth. I would have beat him if I hadn't fell off <laughs> leading the Grand Prix. But anyway, but the good thing was George Harrison, the Beatles, sponsored me. So that was kind of even Shut better. Up, man. No, seriously. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, through Barry knowing George Harrison, and George Harrison thought it was bad that Suzuki's fired me, and he said in his lovely Liverpudlian accent, "Oh, don't worry, ask Steve. I'll sort you out with a few bits and bobs." Gave me a check for fifty-five grand, and I can tell you, in nineteen seventy-seven, uh, seventy-eight, that was a lot of money. Was that um, a, was that a relationship? Uh, you know, being friends with Barry, did that lead to? I got to know George. Lots of, of he like came, lots of celebrities. He, yeah, he came along to some of the races, Spurs, when we were at Paul Ricard in the south of France, and I think he came to Italy, and I got to know him and. Um, some of the Eric Idle, Monty Python people, and they'd come along and watch the racing. Did so when Suzuki fired me, George says, oh, don't worry, because he got so much money, he didn't know what to do with it. Did you go to the gigs and stuff as well? Like, so Not so much, actually. I went to George's house in his studio in Henley-on-Thames and when he was recording and all that kind of thing and got mm. to know him through that did some car racing with him actually or some mm. testing with him in a porsche and bits and pieces it's totally different i'm living the dream you you imagine. <laughs> it's incredible like the thing is sitting here and you're talking about you know your the days of racing mm. stuff and you're just such a laid-back lad you mm. can tell on the d interviews you could tell everything mm. about you that you're just totally laid were you mm. like that like in your racing 
situation. Yeah, I think I was, but I think everyone was really back then. It was so much more chilled out. You didn't have to have a psychiatrist and a dietitian and a, a gym. It was, you, you know, you you kind of just went racing Saturday, Sunday, and then had five days to piss around. That's uh, whereas incredible. now you look at the factory guys. I mean, they don't have one day, do they? Because if no. it's not testing on Monday, it's going to see the dietitian, and then it's in the gym for three days, and then the psychiatrist turns up, and then you have to do this and do that. And that, in that time when I was racing, literally, you turned up at the track on a Friday night, you did your Saturday, Sunday, and then off you went. Do you know that, and you got a big brown envelope as well. That was a nice thing. About it. <laughs> Do you know uh, that, fir that first year being uh, teammates with Barry and you know traveling the world and stuff? Is there any standout moments or memories that? So What's the most ludicrous party? How we? We are not governed by ITV, BBC. Like no, we, we no. can say anything we want on this show. Oh, um, <laughs> the most ludicrous moment. Yeah, but Stephanie Sheen might be listening still. <laughs> ah, she'll be all right. She's yeah, got. She's got. She's got a sense of humor. Well, it, it was. It was. Um, it was wild, yeah. There was okay. there was lots of you know goings on, particularly with the grid girls and the this and the that and everything. That's where because Stavros came. Yeah, from. Yeah, we are. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's yeah, the real it, reason. It could be. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? I'm going to just tell you the story because I I, I uh, still look back on my days enjoying it. And Giacomo Agostini, 15 times world champion, was sort of a hero of mine as well as Barry Sheen and everything else. And I did an evening at uh, the Mercedes Benz World at um, down in London with. Ago, he turned out, he was a guest. It was something to do with Brooklyn's museum. Um, and Ago was the guest of honor. And there was something like 650, 700 people in this auditorium. And I'm about to interview Giacomo Agostini. And we know each other quite well, because I raced against him and he kind of knew who I was. And my first leading question to Ago was, Giacomo, you are a rock star of motorcycling. You um, raced in the 60s and 70s, and, and it was such a great time, and you're such a good looking and living in Italy and everything else. And I said, it was, it was kind of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, wasn't it? And he went really quiet for probably 30 seconds, but it seemed That's like three minutes. <laughs> and I'm shitting myself, because I think I've started it, I wrong. And he just finally looked up and he went, just the sex. <laughs> <laughs> and that started the evening off, you know. It was, it was right brilliant. And it, it, it was a party time because the difference was in Grand Prix, you went from the Italian Grand Prix to the Czechoslovakian one, so you'd all stop at Lake Como with your vans and caravans and all have a good time for two weeks until you went on to the next one. So it was known as the Continental Circus, and it's what it was. It was a bunch of guys, like minded guys, could be from Italy, from Spain, from the Sweden, Finland, you were just traveling around with your van and caravan with my team, which was my girlfriend and one mechanic, three of us, and that was it. We did the whole Grand Prix season in 77. Same in 78. Mm. Yeah. I was going to ask a, a horrendously daft question. Would you trade it all for now? But no, no. Like, no if I had, if I could pick a time to go racing, mm. Mm. I would yeah. scream to be in your shoes. That sounds incredible. I, I'm going to say no, I would never trade it for this, but sure, there's more commercial and there's more money. But what you have to remember, and I'm, it's easy for me to say no, I didn't die, but so many did. And, yeah. it, and it was yeah. horrible. Yeah. There so, was no. nearly every Grand Prix, you drove out the paddock and there'd be a van and caravan parked up because that person didn't make it. He Honestly. died. No, seriously, there was there would be seven or eight, nine or ten a year. And do, mm. do you think that comes from like the you know track safety improvements? Is the it ca it came from mainly track safety because the circuits were lined with Armco barriers. Or you have to remember that we talk about the TT. We know the dangers when you go there, but. Um, Spa was a street circuit, yeah. Finland was a street A lot of the Grand Prix we did were street circuits, there was no different to Isle of Man. Mm. And it was simply the fact that there was no runoff areas, there was solid things to hit. The leathers were useless, your gloves were golf gloves and the helmets were shy. And so, you know, sadly, people died because they hit things. In, in terms of approaching that yourself, I mean, I'm always interested in, you know, especially like people who do the TT and that sort of thing, mm. the, the mindset. Did you used to just sort of convince yourself that, you know, it'll never happen to me? Sure. It, it was, so, was going to happen to someone else. And nearly always when someone did die, which was a tragedy, you'd say to yourself, oh, well, he was asking for it. You know, he wasn't at all. But Try you and justify had, it. You had to justify mm. the fact that it wasn't going to happen to you. Um, and it was, were, I it bet was on the other side there was some shocks or you think, and I didn't expect that from him. Oh, God, yeah. I bet um, there was. The worst part was, and this all sounds very morbid, was the 
the wife and or the girlfriend or whatever you know it was their life was screwed up not so much yours because it was that little bubble you were in and you were going off and going well you know he was asking for it let's go to the next race he won't be there type of thing mm. but it was seeing the wives and families and everything do you, th do you think the whole you know this the sex drugs rock and roll or t type lifestyle do you think that correlated with the high death sure. uh, society? very much so it was, it was, I, i'm not qualified to say it, but it seemed to me like it was a war time yeah. just get on with your life yeah. do whatever it took to don't think about the, the consequences yeah. and now there i am an old bloke never thought i'd get this that, old. that to me <laughs> sounds like a little bit like the tt to be honest the the tt riders to me have a bit of an aura about themselves that sort of like live yeah. for today sure. and like get the most out of life and maybe take mm. more risk just in general life do more yeah. stupid things take more risks yeah but i think you you do you have to balance that out don't you and, and i think there is a um you've not done the tt but you have and you know the, the buzz and the thrill and the adrenaline that you get from doing the Isle of Man. So you have to kind of weigh that all up at the times. And, and sometimes there is nothing better than doing a good job at the Isle of Man and getting away with it. And you think it's, like, it's a bit like, probably be like bloody jumping out of an aeroplane, whatever, there's that real kick and a buzz. Mm -hmm. And when it's all done, it, you can't repeat that in any other way. How many times did you That's race at the Isle of Man TT? It. Um, I must have done, I've got that I've counted them the other day actually because my wife had to clean them. Uh, I've got 13 <laughs> silver replicas, so I finished 13 is it, races. Is your wife a fan of polishing your trophies? She loves the <laughs> polish, yeah, she loves polishing all sorts of things. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I must have probably, back in the day, the attrition rate was high. So if yeah. I've finished 13 times, I must have raced probably 25 times. And if you equate that over a period of two, so I probably did it about seven times, six or seven times. I wasn't, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I wasn't a fan of it because I used to shit myself on the ferry going over there, mm. hoping that I'd be on the way going home. But I definitely, definitely rode the TT at 85%. There's no question about it. Because I I used to finish, my best result, I finished second in a production race, finished third in the senior and then got disqualified. But I was never going to probably win a TT because I just didn't want to go. Get disqualified for um, An alleged oversized fuel tank. Right. Um, and it, it seriously, it was a, so annoying because we stopped twice, the same as everyone else. I finished with three litres of fuel in the tank and it was 300 cc's oversized or something like that. So I was well pissed off with that. Um, but anyway, I was a, I wouldn't say an also ran, but I was a kind of a top middle field person. That was the way I saw the TT and I didn't mind, it didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can honestly, like the mad thing, you know, it's great that you can honestly say I rode that at 85, but like, like looking at it now, I honestly believe everyone's at a hundred percent. I'd agree, no, and that that's, mm. that was my next question yep. to you. Do, do you think that attitude has changed with the island? Yeah, I think it has because I think if you look back and the times that I was doing it, there wasn't so many people taking it that seriously. Serious. You would get. Um, what would weird about the Isle of Man, you have to remember it was in the World Championship up until 76. 77 was the first year. I think it wasn't a world championship round. Uh, but but in 76 or 75, you'd see people that you'd never heard of, like finishing 10th in the world championship because they went to the Isle of Man. But none of the other top riders would go. And that was one of the reasons it lost its championship. Do you reckon, when it was world championship, do you think it was, well, it was world championship. Like, like it's interesting to see because you had your track specialist and it is a unique place without sure. a doubt. But you think if it was a world championship on the line, you'd mm. think, Mm. It'd be more than 100%, well, if you know what I mean. It's yeah, like, I know. Oh, that, that, that was why... It's, oh, oh, come on, everyone, yeah. you know, yeah. the NBA yeah. players, like, yeah. I gave 120%, yeah. you, know, you know what yeah. I mean? All that shit. Yeah. Yeah. You're right, yeah. mathematician, yeah. you can't yeah. get more than one. I think um, that was why it's lost its its um, status as a world championship, because riders did get killed coming over, they're trying to ride it yeah. as a world championship, and they had yeah. no idea where they're going. I think it was Gilberti Pilotti got killed in whatever year, and that was when Ago said, I'm not ever going back there, and Barry Sheen said, I'm not going there. And it was the right thing to do. The TT is for riders that want to go get the the kind of got the balance right the satisfaction to go there but you should never be forced to go there for a championship mm -hmm. and that was one of the reasons actually why the British championship didn't come it, it lost its status here at Scarborough because the same deal we used to have the British championship round here mm -hmm. um, and it was a bit unfair for people that didn't want to ride on a circuit that arguably doesn't have the runoff of Silverstone and Brands Hatch so it lost its status as being a British Championship round here. Mm -hmm. And that was like the beginning of the divide, really, between roads and shorts. Would you say that? Yeah. That, that sounds like, from, like right, yeah. making yeah, an it opinion was. right now, it's because like, Because what happened was circuits became very, very safe. But again, yes. we hark back to 
British Championship racing in 77, 78, 79, 80, all those years, they were dangerous circuits. Brands Hatch had sleepers around it. Alton Park, I mean, I lost so many friends at normal circuits at Alton Park, Dave Potter got killed because he hit a flipping Armco barrier. Uh, Mark Sal at Brands Hatch because he fit, hit the sleepers at the bottom of Paddock Hill. So the circuits were not that much safer than the street circuits. Yes. Then all of a sudden everyone said, this is enough. We've got to give riders runoff areas. Hence now it's a split, a completely divide because you can't change Oliver's Mount, you can't change the TT, you can't change the Northwest. So there is that kind of divide of, are you a roads person or are you a track? It wasn't that long ago, Cadwell Park, like through the woodland section, was yeah. pretty, there wasn't really much runoff. No, all. you're right. And Barn Corner had no runoff, corner, runoff area coming out of there. So all of a sudden circuits that could change did mm -hmm. for the right reasons and circuits that couldn't didn't and you had to choose what you do. Nice. So uh, going back to so you had your two years in Grand Prix was did you? No, I carried on. Uh, seventy seven was my first year factory of Suzuki rider. Then seventy eight, George Harrison sponsored me, and, I, and Suzuki's gave me some decent bikes, and I did all right. And then seventy nine, I got employed back by um, Suzuki f with Barry and the factory team because sadly Pat Hennon spanned himself at the TT, so there was an opening for me, and I went back to ride for them. Won the five hundred British Championship and whatever. Uh, which I've won three British Championships. I think the Open, the 500, and then the Superbike. Uh, and then in 79, Barry leaves Suzuki, um, and I got a private sponsor, kept a Suzuki. Then I got signed up by Yamaha and rode for Yamaha throughout till 86, when I retired from racing, having finished runner-up in the Superstock Championship to Mick Grant, because he cheated. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you, and you, you won a British Superbike Championship, didn't you? Yeah, I did. That's I won a, uh, the Open Championship in 76, uh, then the 500 Shell Sport Championship, which was good because I beat Barry Sheen and all the other guys. Uh, what was the Shell Sport like in today's? It was the main event, really, the Shell Sport, because it was Grand Prix bikes. So right. we'd all be riding 500 two-strokes. Um, so we it, it like was them? the biggest. They were great. I yeah. bet they were. But yeah. the, the, the unridables, that great documentary. That yeah, came out it's with. a great documentary. And, and that's how they were a little bit. I mean, everyone had broken collarbones and stuff like that. <laughs> was it, I'm sure, because I've, I've been to a few of your mad tour things, and right. I thoroughly enjoyed them, by the way. Thank um, you. But I'm sure you mentioned a story once about when you were teammates with Barry and uh, he, he had he couldn't qualify, so you qualified for both oh, yeah, of you. Yeah. And you out qualified. That was, that was at Mallory Park. Can you imagine that happening now? You know, I mean, we literally. He'd, he'd, Actually, it's quite funny because I get people telling me that I'm telling the story wrong because James Whitton was doing a tour with Foggy and he used to embellish it and tell it a different way. <laughs> and, Are you sure? Yeah, I said, I'm definitely telling it true because, because James managed to embellish it, the fact that Barry got drunk the night before and couldn't ride his bike, but it was nothing to do with him getting drunk. Uh, it was his knee ligament popped out and he had to go off to see a chiropractor to get that fixed and, and they sort of put a blanket over him, took him out of Mallory Park, where his dad did to find a chiropractor, which meant he'd misqualified and he didn't want to start from the back of the grid. So even my team manager, Rex White at the time for Suzuki said, is there any chance you'd put Barry's leathers on and take the number seven bike out? I'm going, any chance I'd pay you for that? So off I went. And what was so funny, I'd get to the hairpin, I've got a dark visor on, sheen helmet, leathers, boots, gloves, the whole lot, and all the girls are waving their knickers at me and everything else. <laughs> Little did they know there's a bloke with big nose and big ears underneath that helmet. Go on, go on, Barry, take the helmet off. No, <laughs> not yet, pet. Yeah, I'll take so, the leathers off. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, had to do, I did three, three laps on his bike, shot into the awning, scurried out the back, got changed in my gear, went out and did about 10 laps on my bike and came in, looked at the qualifying times and they were handwritten in those days on the toilet block, nice. in, the middle, on the toilet block in the middle of Mallory Park. And Barry comes back and we wandered up there and sure enough, there's Barry Sheen on the front row and I'm on the bleeding second row and I'm out qualified myself. <laughs> yeah. How does that happen? In three laps. It must be in his bike. Or maybe the pants being waved at. <laughs> Possibly. Bit of everything. You've got, to throw, bit, it all, you've got yeah. to throw it all together, haven't you? Yeah, you've got to throw yeah. it all together. So then after that uh, time in the British Championships, um, was it, uh, what, at what point did you cross over to truck racing? Um, I started doing some truck racing before I finished racing bikes, actually. It was uh, 73 or, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, 83 maybe 84, the truck racing came to the UK. Same thing, it was Barry that fixed it up for me in some ways. Well, he had a deal, when you see some of Barry's bikes at the end of his career, a DAF on the back of his bikes. Um, and he had an association with DAF trucks where they supplied him a truck and everything else. So they wanted him to race the DAF truck when the, it came to Donington, it was Donington Park, it was called the multi-part truck Grand Prix. And I was really envious. And the main reason I was envious 
Barry Sheen was undoubtedly a far better motorcycle rider than I was, but we used to do a lot of celebrity car races. That used to go on in those days where someone like Shell would get you in a celebrity car race at Brands Hatch in a Ford Fiesta or whatever, and then we did one at Silverstone in minis, and I could always kick his ass in a car. So when truck racing turned up, oh, I was you. massively <laughs> envious. So I actually took myself along to Mercedes-Benz at Milton Keynes, and I said, uh, I got to see, I don't know how I got the appointment with someone. I said, I'm Steve Parrish, race motorbikes, and they kind of knew who I was. Barry Sheen's driving a DAF. If you want to beat the DAF, you better give me a Mercedes. And they kind of got a dealer to give me a truck. And it was a company called Mitchell Cotts from Ipswich. And in those days, they were road trucks, literally. It was just the front part of an articulated truck. There was nothing, no roll cages in it, no nothing. And sure enough, went to, Brand to Donington for this event and huge... Donington had the biggest crowd it had ever, ever had. 100,000 people turn up, blocked the M1 and everything else. Have you the ever driven a truck at this point? No. That was just... That, was, that was kind of, I'll go back, because they, <laughs> they said, you're obviously a good truck driver. Oh, yeah, absolutely, you know, HGV here and there. And so they put they let me have one on the road. And I ain't got a license or anything. I've got all the gears wrong and stuff. And I said, oh, I'm used to an ERF, you know. <laughs> and it lied through my teeth. And we get to Donington, and um, the race came about. The first lap I did, I went straight off the track, down through Craner Curves in this Mercedes truck, because what I hadn't worked out, that those spring seats in them, it bounced so much, I couldn't reach the brakes when I got to the old hairpin, so I went straight off <laughs> the track. Got it back on, we went down, we got some big straps and tied the seat down and so on, and ended up finishing second in the race, beating Barry was like six or seven, so job done. And it just escalated from there. Please um, tell me you rang Mercedes good about this check, this bonus check for yeah, podiums. Yeah. I actually, and I put my hand up, I earned far more money out of racing trucks than I did motorbikes. Mint, is, yeah. that's yeah. mint. Does yeah. truck racing still take place? Yeah, now? it does. Not, not the same level as it was. And throughout the career, I always drove for Mercedes because in the end, they got me in what was the full factory team based in Stuttgart and whatever. Um, and unfortunately for me in 2001, I would probably get a bit long in the tooth anyway, Mercedes quit. And truck racing took a bit of a dive because it would be tantamount to Ferrari pulling out of Formula One. It was like the, they were the main focus. They put more money into it. They paid for the TV. So MAN, DAF, Caterpillar, uh, they all kind of withdrew their major sponsorship and it was huge in 2000 my truck had 2250 horsepower uh it was worth about a million and a half quid it was so high tech you wouldn't believe it. the engines lasted 300 kilometers in a truck and they'd change an engine in 20 minutes for people that don't know put that into miles what's 300 kilometers in miles uh it's about 170 miles holy yeah. shit! and how yeah. much would it be a swap on that oh god only knows but they had a team of 10 mechanics that would have a crane there with an engine on it and a gearbox they had quick connections and 20 minutes later fresh engine was in there and i'd go out and qualify because it had another 50 horsepower or something. it was like oh, formula wow. one it was daft yeah that is incredible is it, it, that is incredible. might sound stupid but i'm just thinking because you're so high off the ground is it quite dangerous if it tips it doesn't tip because the engine's low it, they look like trucks but they had mid engines Flat. everything was low down you could slide it through the corners and just drive it on the throttle and power slide it and things like that Holy um, crap. and it was it was fascinating because they developed diesel engines through truck racing if you you're not old enough now but What's the first diesel? What age were you when you knew the first diesel? Tell me what age you would have been when you sort of got into cars. Well, it was, what I was year? born in 95. You so. were born in 95, right. Mm. So you you might just remember a, a Fiesta in 98 that rattled and smoked and was a pile of shite. Yeah, my dad Where, had a Ford Transit and the, right. advert, the advert was like the, the um, you know, the one that was beating the minis. It was, yeah. on, it was on a guy, oh, Martin yeah. program. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah like, I remember. Yeah. Get off but it. in the early days of diesels, they were horrible things. You only bought a diesel if you liked the smell and the noise. That was all. And no turbos, no, no nothing. nothing. Lagged, uh, but, horrible. But then all of a sudden, diesels now, they're better than petrols really they're just as clean they're just as fast they've got more torque and that was mercedes did all their development through truck racing so kind of we were involved in a lot of changes and and prototypes of this and that and everything else just speak, just speaking of sliding four wheels you've uh, just reminded us of probably one of my favorite stories from from your um your talk mm. about uh one, one of you unusual vehicles that you have at home and uh, sliding around roundabouts i don't don won't know this story no so probably not well i've had a that. i've had a sort of pension for odd vehicles um and, and it started off with an armored car i think i had for a while <laughs> 
uh, and then I had a trotter Is it, man. Was this was this around the time of the Rossi hate mail kind of thing? I thought <laughs> yeah, I need to go to been. Morrison's. It, it was a time when I was racing <laughs> trucks because I got bored because literally I'd be doing 12 races a year. They were paying me plenty of money and so I'd have a load of time to do very little. So I kept buying all these weird vehicles and stuff like that. So the one you're talking about, I ended up, I've had a couple of hearses actually now. I bought a hearse. Um, and you might think that's a bit morbid, but it's the funniest car you can ever drive around in because you can get, do, you can do anything. The first time I bought one, I want, it was around Christmas time and I just went in the middle of pedestrian area in Cambridge, lifted the, the boot up on the hearse and went shopping, came back three hours later and there was no parking ticket or anything because they just, they just let you get away with anything with the hearse because it's too unrespectful, isn't Please it? Please tell me you went and like, put flowers on like mum. I used somewhere. to have a box in the back sure and when I bought it, I bought one my size to save the family some money when I go. Um, do you know who I, you'll know him. My sponsor in 1980 was a guy called Bill Fry. Now his son runs a team. Um, uh, what's the Darren Fry? Darren Fry. Yeah. It's Darren Fry's dad sponsored me in 1980, and Darren Fry is that's from an undertaker's company. Yeah, that's it. And so I used to buy my hearses from them, and I had um, I had a grey one and a black one, and I even on one occasion unwittingly went down the outside of some traffic in the hearse because I had a police siren on it as well, which is unusual for a hearse. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and I cut in and I'm in I'm only in a proper funeral procession and there's all these people not knowing which one to follow see I was in St Albans and I would never forget the fact that you could see all these people going <laughs> when I turn right I'd cast with me <laughs> anyway I had so much fun with my hearse doing all sorts of daft things um, like passing people 100 miles an hour down the A1 and all that sort of thing in the box in the back and I used to leave the pins out so when I went in a corner the old box used to slide around sure <laughs> Uh, and it, yeah, it was just an awful lot of fun. But anyway, Please and then I, then people told me it was disrespectful and stuff like oh, that. Wet wipes. There I you know, go. I know, Imagine I know. you turning up into Goodwood. You know what I mean? Just chuck your yeah. daughter to the back, wheel it out. I, I, I'm going to tell you another. Well, I actually went to uh, to Wimbledon in it one year uh, <laughs> to the tennis. I got invited to Wimbledon, and I was I was going in the special car park area, and, and it's such a posh area that normally you get out and someone drives your car. <laughs> they wouldn't get in. No one would get in it. And I had a, I had an arm out the back of the box as well it used to like a false arm and i put a nice watch on it and that'd be bouncing around in the back when did this practical joke come is this literally where you're like 10 11 like you thought like i love a practical joke and your twitter yeah. feed's brilliant to watch yeah. and it's like i don't know when it all came about i think through being a bit bored sometimes and just <laughs> just love making people laugh actually so yeah it's been an awful i had a fire engine uh which was always quite good fun um <laughs> Uh, a, an ambulance again now all these things are really good for parking you can go where you like and park them up and stuff like that I bet your kids never wanted you to pick, your, pick them up from school well my daughter if she was naughty on a Sunday night I'd say you're going to school in the trotter van and she used to hate it because they had a blow up doll stuck in the back window and she shut up but you actually had a, three a Robin Reliant Robin, painted up Robin Reliant that I bought from it was blue when I bought it I was I got in a traffic jam in Birmingham got diverted off of Birmingham and sh there she was sat on someone's drive a blue one and I thought I've got to have it so I went over did a deal with a bloke paid him what he wanted for it because it got a for sale sign on it and went to pick it up with a mate of mine and we got laughing so much because we took a car trailer forgetting about the middle wheel and it wouldn't go up it would sit in the middle wouldn't it, <laughs> it wouldn't go up the car trailer so we had to go to a building site and be able to steal Get a, a scaffold, scaffold plank, plank. But we're giggling so bad in this bloke wants to give me all the documents for the Rhino Lion Owners Club and little does he know I'm going to get it home, spray it yellow, have it all painted up. I even had a diesel injector so it smoked on it. It cost me about three grand in the end to have it all converted. That is mint. Mm. And anyway, we used to drive around in that and I had um, like the bicycle kitty wheels, you know, you'd have on the back of a trike out the front wings to stop it tipping over too much because it'd be up on... Did you have it helped all of it? You must, have, you must have sorry how, sorry uh, did you have a turned over that being a robber oh must loads have of times that okay. was my party trick to go into a car park and just roll it on its side and get out <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so I actually need a wee. I'm actually I'm gonna leave you two here for a second. Carry on. I'm, I'm away. I'm, I'm away. You, you used to uh, do a lot, of, a lot of flying with Barry. Did you used to fly yourself, or did you used to just go in with him? Uh, we. I mainly went with him because he had a helicopter, and I've only got a fixed wing license. I started doing my helicopter's license when Barry did his. But you've got to be very, very wealthy to fly a helicopter because they just eat up money. So I decided I'm gonna have a fixed wing, which is. I lived on the Isle of Man for a period, and it was much more practical flying a fixed wing backwards and forwards and things like that. But I did quite a lot of hours with Barry in helicopters and we did get in some muddles I have to say um, we did things that you definitely shouldn't have 
done, um, like flying in bad weather and nearly hitting towers and so on and so on. Um, and, and ironically, we got away with all those things and, and sadly, um, he passed away with something which seemed normal. I couldn't understand that. It, Barry Sheen was invincible as far as I was concerned, he raced all his life in a dangerous period, did all sorts of daft things and then died of something that normal people die of, which is cancer of the esophagus. So it was a real tragedy. But I've always loved flying and there's an element that, that flying can give you a bit of satisfaction because it is sometimes a bit scary mm -hmm. and it's that adrenaline buzz that you get with it. A lot of, a lot of people we've had on the show actually, like especially ex-racers, uh, have a yeah. connection with flying. Yeah. Loads of people, like yeah, especially sure. later in life, uh, flying lessons, helicopters or... or yeah, or, yeah. Uh, and I think it's that stretching yourself a bit and that's what racing does, doesn't it? It stretches you to the maximum. You know, you're riding around and, and you're, you're kind of focused on something and flying's a bit like that. You forget about if someone's, you've upset someone, you're in trouble with someone, it's something that will make you focus. And so I treat that as my sort of um, thing that an old bloke can do and it makes me concentrate and focus. Did it, you know when he gave up two wheels? Mm. How gutted were you? Or were you just like well, ready luckily, to move on from I was one of the, one of the fortunate ones because truck racing took over straight away. So it gave me nothing like, and I'll, I'll say this and upset some truck drivers. It, it, it was fun. I loved racing and I loved being competitive, but I didn't, I did miss motorbike racing. There is nothing like motorcycle racing, in my opinion. And even the Formula One guys know that. They watch bike race and they, they admire all the bike guys because that sharp edge that you talk about is really sharp in yeah. motorcycle racing because you make a mistake and you end up sliding down the road, don't you? Mm. So truck racing didn't fully take over, but it was a nice way of my adrenaline buzz kind of being tapered off. And that lasted another 10, 12 years. Yeah, but you're, you're so heavily involved in motorcycling. Mm. You know, it's not like you've stepped away from the world. A lot of riders, you know, we were briefly discussing mm. that about like, you know, mm. people climbing up the ranks and moving mm. up the ladder mm. and they just get so close. And, and a lot of people just go bang. But you were, you. I think the reason they do, and I understand that, because it's hard to come back and be involved and not doing it. I, I really do understand how. Uh, and we briefly spoke this before we came on air. I, I feel sorry for a lot of motorcycle riders, and, and that must be the same whether you be a flinking horse jumper, a cricket player, a tennis player, a footballer. When you stop doing what you love doing, and it's been all of your life, there's a massive void. And 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 I can understand why some people go off the rails and do daft things. You know, and they do, don't they? Go and buy a bloody motorcycle shop, and it lasts two weeks and or two years, and then all of a sudden, Fred blogs his shops, bikes are cheaper, and that goes down the pan. And then you can footballers buy a pub, and everyone wants to go to that pub for two years, and then they don't. So trying to find a career after your sport that you've been so wrapped up in and so focused can be very, very difficult. Now, I'm very, very open on this pod and we, we discuss it regularly. You know, like my fear is not being a part of the sport. Right. You know what I mean? I want to race. I'm, I'm scared. Sure. I'm generally scared of giving it up because one day it, it, it will have to happen. Yeah, but, but it will be hard you come back and watch all people racing when you're not. You see, my dad, right, he's 62, does right. a TT, classic, everything right. like that. He doesn't come watch me race. No, right. Because okay. his exact words are, why should I go watch you have the fun? And yeah. he gets on a bike and yeah. races yeah. and he loves it. Yeah. But I can totally understand Well, that. I I had a period of time sort of when I stopped racing and still doing a bit, I'd turn up at a race meeting, you know, I might go to Brands Hatch, British Superbikes, or I might go to something else. And you're like a spare prick at a wedding, aren't you? Everyone's busy, everyone's focused, everyone's got things to do, and you're standing around there trying to talk to them, so it doesn't work. So I do understand why do you, people walk away. Do you still do a bit of riding uh, these days yourself? Yeah, not as much as I did. I still do classic stuff. I do Goodwoods and um, You're a I demon go round Goodwoods. He's, he elbows out portions dish, Chris. He's, yeah. he's hungry this young and I'm telling you, yeah, get yeah. out there. We, we got on the podium last, I, I must admit, um, um, young Mr. Cooper helped me out a lot. Um, he was he was he's very on, fast. He was on pole, wasn't he? He was on pole. He on put our bike. bike on pole. Then I started the race and jumped it, and no one knew, which was really good. I pretended my legs were hurting badly. I needed a pusher, so I had someone push me off, and I got about a second and a half lap uh, start. But it was great fun. So, and I ride at classic events. I'll probably be riding and demoing a bike up here at the Gold Cup or Barry Sheen event. I sometimes do the old track day just to blow the cobwebs out and mm. do some testing on some bikes. And do you have some uh, nice sort of bikes at home that you... I do. I've got three of my RG500s from 70, 78, 79 and 80. A uh, little 250 Yamaha that we spoke about earlier. I've got an FZ750 that I used to race in 75, 76 when I retired. Uh, they'd be the race bikes. And then I've got some nice old road bikes of things like... Um, a lovely 250 Yamaha that was my first road bike in 68, I think, a YDS3. 
uh, Norton Dominator because I raced one at Goodwood and so I thought I'd get myself one. So yeah, I've got a bit of a collection, a Panther sidecar outfit. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Imagine, have, touch wood for the love of God, the house is on fire, you can only save one bike. What would that bike be? That would be a really good question. I'd probably just get an RG out of there. I really love RG 500s. My whole career was wrapped around them. Yeah. Um, so I'd, yeah, I'd probably run and get my best RG 500, the one that's probably the most valuable, I suspect. Uh, and that would be it, yeah. And then I'd probably throw the wife over the others to put them out. <laughs> <laughs> be a dear, go in the garage and just pat them out, will you? Smother them. Uh, yeah. so I thought you loved this. Put the bike out, will you? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that that would be uh, probably the one that I would take away. Yeah, and do you know from your from your truck way? Uh, in fact, uh, just something else that's just popped into my mind. Are you still the Guinness Book of Record holder, Guinness World? Oh, uh, do you know I was a mouthful, Chrissy. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if I still am, but I was. You're absolutely right. For a number of years, I had the world reversing speed record. How um, did that come about? The Isle of Man, I. No 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 no, 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 no. It was. I tell you how that came about. In between my period, which I often miss out of bikes and trucks. In the early days of truck racing, BP was my sponsor. I always raced for BP. And the marketing department of BP UK said, well, it's great we sponsor Steve and he's doing really well, but we don't see enough of him in the UK. So they got me uh, in the Caterham, Vauxhall Caterham Challenge, which is a sports car challenge with Caterham cars. And they're great cars. They really are. They're fabulous things to drive on a track. So I did a whole, I did three years of racing Caterhams and the boss of Caterhams in the UK uh, where they were built, um, wanted to do this record of, they reckon they could get a Caterham going faster in reverse than most cars. And the reason being is they fitted a Suzuki Hayabusa in some of the Caterhams, which were light and fast. And of course, a motorcycle doesn't have reverse. So the way that they designed it to have a reverse, they had a transfer box. So you put it in first and then touched a button and it reversed first gear. And so for the road cars, they locked it so you could only put it in first and then they use the transfer box. They said, if we disconnected the transfer thing, you'll have six reverse gears. So that's what we did. We went to Bruntingthorpe and I sat in this little cage and all strapped him. Being a lorry driver, I could use my mirrors. So I just used my mirrors and it was like in reverse. We did about hundred miles an hour in reverse. hundred wow. mile an hour in reverse. It yeah. was at hundred mile an hour your arse started skipping. Let's face it. You yeah, know, like, it, it was, it, do you know what's hard? I, I don't know if you've ever tried driving a car fast in reverse, but a car <laughs> has when I get cast a camber Ackerman to, you know, when you go in a corner and let go of your steering wheel, what's it do? It comes straight. Yeah. It, it, it's got a, a balance system where the, the geometry makes it go. So in reverse, let go of the steering wheel, it just goes on full lock. So you have to grip pretty tight going fast in reverse. But I worked this out that if the whole thing went to a pile of shit, what was going to happen? I was going to spin and end up going forwards. So it didn't seem that dangerous to me. Did you have a few close? Uh, yeah, we did. I spun a couple of times just by just a little twitch and it went on to full lock. So I worked our system out where I had my knuckles in some foam to keep it nice and straight. And, and that's what we did, yeah. That's mint. I wonder mm. if any of our listeners are going to try that and like and, uh, a Robert Reliant. <laughs> <Yeah. better. laughs> no, from from you uh, truck racing to commentating, which is, you know, like I said, I was born in 95. Yeah. Early days of uh, watching bike racing for me was like yeah. the early 2000s watching on the BBC. Yeah. And, uh, you know, British bikes i remember like it was the days of you know michael h and plant honda the rizzler yeah. suzuki hawk i was like yeah, john that reynolds and Ex Carolina. yeah exactly yeah. and i used to love watching uh you know british shooter bikes on t t what's the word terrestrial, terrestrial tv mm. yeah yeah and uh, yeah, it was air. fantastic and yeah. you you won with uh, charlie australian fellow yeah i it? did i did some i did well first ever year i did with an australian called lee uh well actually to start with when i was doing british it would have been with barry nutley probably quite in the early yeah. days sometimes jack burner called barry nutley then there was a guy called Lee Diffie came over who I got on really well with and then Charlie Cox came, got involved and the reason Charlie Cox got involved um, was that he was contracted to BBC doing touring cars and then they lost touring cars and he was still under contract um, and a lot of people slagged Charlie off but he actually was quite a good bike rider rode his bikes around everything else but he was always that oh that bloody car man which you get but yeah we did I love yeah, yeah. that combination myself yeah, yeah it worked quite well so we did British Superbikes and we did World Superbikes um, and uh, I've got, I'm just gonna, I've just, you just reminded me of something now. The British Superbikes was a something like a 30 minute highlight package would go on BBC Two in Sunday afternoons. And we used to record that. We'd go to the track and do all the links, but the commentary would be over the edited tape for the 30 minute highlight package. And we'd go to Wimbledon where there was a studio Century TV, it might have been, or something like that. And they were a bunch of boring people. But, <laughs> and, and they always just sat there. And I decided to liven them up one day. So I went in on my bike. I had a free Triumph or something like that. 
um, and I'd managed to capture a jackdaw and I put it in my backpack and I walked into the studio. And I'll never forget in this whole kind of open studio area, I just unzipped my backpack and went to the toilet. Well, when I came out, this place was in pandemonium. People were evacuating out of windows and doors as a flipping jackdaw is flying around everywhere and there was coffee cups flying. It was just so funny. But anyway, I felt that I did the jackdaw good because I relocated it from Cambridgeshire to Wimbledon. It's a much nicer area, isn't it? <laughs> what, like, sorry, walk me through the idea behind it, where you just going down the lane and went. Well, I just, that would be mint crack, yeah. that, you know. And so, did you just sneak up like Dora the Explorer with your net and just hunk no, it? I got, I was, I, I caught, the, I, we had a, a trap to get, catch jackdaws because they used to eat all the little birds' eggs and robins Aye. and so on. Like that. So they're they're a bit of a pest actually. But I thought this was too good to waste to not. Just, <laughs> Use it for something else. Has there ever been a time when, in, in uh, sort of good faith, you've went to do like a practical joke that you would have thought was just a bit, of, and then it's like turned really like got it's really gone out south. of hand. It's gone just, south. Yeah, there, there has on occasion, quite a near number of occasions. But probably the worst one, my sponsor when I was running the team and when I was still racing was Loctite, Loctite Yamahas. And the sales manager uh, was a bit of a practical joke and he was always mucking around and things like that. But the managing director, asked me to set the sales manager up with something and and we were down in Cheltenham way um, on a pheasant shoot I think it was because Loctite did all these corporate events where they'd invite the boss of B&Q and whoever was buying Loctite and like entertain them back in the days when you could. So anyway the managing director who is still a mate of mine Jeff Bennett at the time said you've got to set up Phil Cork his name wasn't he? he was a sales manager and he just got a brand new BMW 323i or something company car it was and he was so proud of this car and I used to have um, a lot of you can't get them so easily now but you can buy these things called stage maroons and they're a little thing about that big about the well, how big would it half the size of a matchbox I guess you say with two wires coming out of them and you could set them off with any electrical power it could be one volt two volt ten volt twelve volt whatever any electrical current would set them off they were known as a stage maroon if you go to the theater and there's that boom goes off and that's what they were and i had pockets full of these things so i used to like <laughs> like using them anyway i connected <laughs> i connected at lunchtime i connected up under the bonnet to his left hand indicator a stage maroon and so we were all waiting for him to leave because we knew he had to leave to get home to his wife. And we knew when he got to the turn, he'd put his left hand <laughs> in the car. Anyway, sure enough, he gets the turn, puts his left hand in the car, and it blew the bonnet clean off of it. Shut yeah, up, man. Yeah, no, seriously. Yeah, it was very embarrassing. Yeah. I thought it would just be a, like a boof. And we put a bag of flour over it so you get flour blowing out everywhere. And I just thought it'd be a little boof like that. Well, we're sat there watching the next thing. It's three, two, three, I bonnet blows off. Did you, did you fess up or did you just keep your nose no clean? He, but the managing director thought it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen because he didn't care but the bloke got out of the car was staggering around he thought he'd been Shell hit shock. by a flipping bomb he didn't know what had happened so so anyway they had to get him a taxi home and he was a bit shell-shocked at what went on he looked like so, he had a week on normandy beach at the storm yeah, yeah so there's been a number of things that went off a bit wrong yeah, mm -hmm. yeah but there you go so i've got other silly and then from, oh macau went to prison in macau that was again for let's talk off. through it let's go well that was another uh, sort of fireworky thing that went off in the brothel in macau after the race and i knew there'd be a few people in there that i knew and sure enough they were and we organized a group of three of us to roll this big fire and it was a big firework it was massive did you just go to the, like the local like well macau around? where they make all the chinese fireworks so you can buy the biggest firework you've ever seen in your life it's like the size of a 45 gallon drum and half as deep that. and it costs you about three quid so i bought a couple of these big 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 fireworks and we decided at nine o'clock to roll them in the brothel where we thought there'd be a few people we know and i was actually the getaway driver but it was when we lit it it was going off so well i wanted to watch it and sure enough um uh, Boot Van Dolm and Jack Middleburg racers all came out of all the smoke that was going on and it was pandemonium but unbeknown to me and the other guys the chief of police's um, driver was sat at the bar watching everything that went on they saw us roll it in followed us back to the hotel and we ended up three days in prison before this is after the race you've done the race oh, the race is all over this is Sunday night and a giggle everyone else is everyone going else on the flight the brothel, and you're, yeah. you're sitting there getting locked how, how yeah. did you wriggle out of that one then I had a wriggle out I didn't I did three days in prison we had to get the British consulate involved I'd, I'd actually 
just got married to my first wife and you can imagine the phone call i'm in prison for blowing up a brothel yeah. that went i down didn't like ag a i didn't agree with the policy no, love i yeah, was disgusted yeah, and yeah, i yeah. just full-on went for it there. that went down like a kidney stone as you can imagine mm. that's mm. mint i think that is the best macau story because you know what you know why because every other rider bottles it no no every other rider bottles it got any macau stories uh yeah. uh no yeah, yeah. so you're top uh, of the table uh, so yeah. i got banned yeah for four i wasn't allowed back in macau i actually got banned from the country how mm. many years four years until it got taken over by the Chinese it was owned by the Portuguese yes so it was on my passport not allowed into Macau so on the fifth year did you just stroll back in I did go back actually as a commentator because I've given up racing there so I did I have been back since but it's quite funny to be banned from a country you want to go back yeah I wouldn't mind going back actually I love I had so much fun in Mint. Macau I love it yeah. it's absolutely yeah, yeah. I actually enjoy the track like yeah, a lot of people yeah. go just for the little bit but the track yeah. is immense like yeah. it's, it's quite um poignant because bless him Murray Walker who I got quite friendly with uh, Murray through working with him commentating and everything else and the first time I met him was in Macau he was out there doing the commentary for Macau and after the races it I doubt if it goes on now but the the rate we would go on the races were generally on Saturday I think are they still on Saturday maybe they still on the Saturday aye aye anyway the, maybe the Monday morning we'd all head back to Hong Kong on the ferries and whatever you went on and the organizers back then used to organize big boats to take us out around Kowloon Bay and we'd go water skiing and we'd drink lots of beer and we'd eat lovely food and it was like a party and they used to have an F1 boat and a bike boat and so there'd be a bit of competition who could jump the furthest and this that and the other anyway Murray asked me if I would teach him to water ski because I used to do a lot of water skiing it was one of my hobbies and I agreed to do it and we got a boat organized and had some skis and the rope and Murray was in the walker water and at, at the time all the boats were watching and we we're all anchored up and everything else everyone's watching what's going on and i'm in the water because the easiest way to teach someone to water ski is to get in the water with them and hold them and stop them tipping over and all that kind of thing so i've got him all steady skis in front of him bent knees arms around his knees pull boat gets the rope tight and murray popped up but i pulled his trunks down as he sure. went <laughs> <laughs> and he did a whole lap of flipping Hong Kong Bay with his trunk with his willy out. Which fair, is quite funny. Hey, fair play, got up man. first time. First time out. Are yeah. we talking about on the skis? Or are we talking about no, we drop the, the pants skis, straight on up the on the skis? <laughs> on the skis. Yeah. What a story! Yeah. Yeah. Now, after um, so you commentating team management uh, these days with you know you're still commentating, but um, do you keep tabs on sort of British racing and are you watching? Yeah, I do. Um, not as I I would, and I do miss, and I have done certainly last year. A lot of the young riders I wouldn't know now. I mean, I met you really for the first time yeah. here, and and that is not so much fun because you, especially if you're involved in it, you kind of feel as though you want to know people. So, and I like I don't I used to know every single Grand Prix rider there was when I was covering it for twelve years, but now I haven't got I've never met that Maverick Vinales, and I don't know Morbidelli, and you know so. I watch it and and, and uh, I'm pleased to say, I'm really pleased to say, it looks like it's coming back as on free-to-air channels now. It was good to see ITV4 covering it. Mm -hmm. um, and I I really hated the fact that it went to BT, not just because it knocked BBC out, but Dorna should have known that the viewing figures would be shy. And they yes. are. They're like 180,000 people and it used to be 2 million people. So it's bad for the sport, it's bad for young riders coming through because the managing director of your B&Q and everything or what, whoever it might be are not going to be watching motorbike racing. No. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to sponsor young riders. They're not going to know what it's about. We've lost that momentum that it had. Everybody in the UK knew who everyone was because they would sit on a Sunday afternoon and watch, and watch it. Racing. It's a little bit like, do you know, when you're talking about, say, Barry being mates with, you know, people in the Beatles and all, all that mm. sort of thing. These days, you know, if like Cal Crutchlow, you wouldn't, you would never sort of see Cal Crutchlow knocking about with like other top celebrities, not, no, uh, not sure. in the sporting uh, world, but you would never, you would never Never see him like knocking about with David Beckham and things like that. No, it's yeah. it's totally different in, in the sport. Like you said, it possibly could be quite short sighted to take a, a little bit more money for TV. But in terms of the whole sport, sure. it, for me, yeah. you know, I, I, I love yeah. uh, the Eurosport coverage and I think it's brilliant. The fact mm. that if four bike fans they can sit and watch all the, uh, they can you can sit on a full Sunday and do six seven hours of racing. Yeah. However, for me, I, you know, when it was on BB, BBC, mm. although it would just be the the main race. Mm. Everyone, Everyone knew it. who like Michael yeah, Rutter was. And... Exactly. And you could you could walk into somewhere and, and someone would go, Oh, you're into bike racing. I love that racing the other day. And that doesn't happen now, does it? So it's it's shrunk by ninety percent of mm. the viewers. Much more niche than that. Very much so. And sure, the people that buy motorcycle news will probably pay their pay TV and watch it. But the that, what I call the, the casual viewer doesn't yeah. see it anymore what, now. What would you like to see just as a sort of generalization for the sport? Is there anything that you would like other than the TV thing going free to air, is there any other uh, direction for the sport that you would 
would like to see change sometime soon. Would you like to see the money back in it? Um, certainly in BSB, you mean? Yeah, we talk because there's plenty of money in my GP, obviously. Oh no, of course, yeah. Top, but yeah. Like, when you talk about there's lads who you have to pay for rides now. You yeah. know what I mean? There's only yeah. a very small market. Unfortunately, I don't see how that can ever really change because mm, there honest. is so much money required, and it happened yes. in Formula One ten years ago, and it's now creeping into what we're at now. And I think it was Lewis Hamilton said the other day. I wouldn't say I'm a big fan of Lewis Hamilton, but he actually said, unfortunately, the Formula One paddock now is a billionaire's playground. And it yes. really is because just about every driver that gets into Formula One now has been nurtured all the way through, but bought drives to get themselves into Formula One. Yes. And that is happening a bit in bike racing now, isn't it? And yes, it, it, totally it, agree. So for, if, for, would, would your answer be sort of just the money side of things? Yeah, I think um, you, you do need more. Uh, I think the Spanish people have it with their academies and their CEV championships where you can turn up on a little 50 or 125 and you can see who's got the talent. Mm. We don't have that so much here now because let's face it, motorcycle racing is a tiny, tiny minority sport. Yeah, mm. it really is. We we easily forget that, but it's nowhere, is it? You know, when you look yeah, at no, that's the honest it's side. Sad, of it, it's yeah. a sad thing. It's, uh, it's very exciting and it's probably the best sport to watch that I can imagine even if you weren't a big fan of it but yes. the fact of the matter is that it's a tiny tiny sport and I don't see how we're going to climb out of this unless we have somebody that puts money into it to try and encourage people to get into it what is straight away very easy to understand Spain and Italy for a start and I'm going to use those two countries kids can have a scooter at 15 they can't have a car till they're 18 they live in a country where the sun shines. So they have a three year period of tick, where tick, tick, they tick. are going to be riding a scooter. And the parents out there don't say you can't have a scooter because they, they want them to have one because they can get around. What happens in this country, you've got one year to have a scooter from 16 when you can't have a car till you're 17. Virtually every parent I know says, you're not, not having a scooter, I'll buy you a car when you're 17. Mm -hmm. And so the stigma, there's a huge stigma. Yeah, we're, we're trying to pick riders from a tiny, tiny pot. Whereas in Spain and Italy and other countries, Latin type countries, they've got a massive pot to pick from because everyone rides bikes. Mm -hmm. So we're never going to be as popular bike racing over here as it is mm. in some of those countries. I've just got a, a few questions. Well, we're on a Patreon page. Got a few okay. questions on there. Um, we've got one from Cathy Jones Paris saying, "I've read the Parish Times and listened to the audiobook multiple times, and each time I pick up something, something different. Absolutely fascinating insight and brilliant read slash listen." That was just a thank you. All right. Well, well it's, thank you very much for reading my book and coming to the Mad Tour shows. It's, it's Parish Times. Parish Times is a book that I wrote with Matt Roberts, who you all know because yeah. Matt works for Eurosport, and Matt and I worked together for four or five years. And after I quit or after BBC uh, lost the contract, I had a bit of a period where I wasn't doing so much and I finally got to go through all my um, memories and stories and things and sat down with Matt and wrote a book, The Parish Times, which has been very successful. Yeah. Please. And is that available on Amazon Audio? It's available Audible. available on Amazon, but you're much better off going to steveparishracing.com where you get a personalised nice. signed book. Yeah. It might cost you a couple of quid more than Amazon, but it's personally signed and it comes with a free poncho. Happy days. Who does the narrating yourself on that? On the book. On the book, yeah. The audible side of it, yeah. Yeah, I did it myself, yeah. Right, yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah. So, you yeah, you want the audio book, it's on Amazon. And I sat in a studio for three days, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. Really? Uh, well, because you think it's dead easy. I don't know. You just pick I'm, your book I'm up probably not the best reader because I didn't spend a lot of time at school. A little mm -hmm. dyslexic. But when you're reading a book, you have to have all the punctuation correct and so on and so the on. The way you deliver it. Exactly. The the, the and there's a guy sat beside you going, can you do that again? Because it didn't sound quite right. So you spend three really? days doing it. It's a question that I, I find fascinating. Uh, for somebody that, like you said, that didn't stick in at school and didn't sort of go down that mm. um, you know, academic did, world, academic world. but as a, as a commentator and a, a, a talk show host, you're very articulate in terms mm. of like speaking, using big mm. words in like the right context and stuff. That's Cambridge how, art. Yeah. How... <laughs> Uh, that doesn't let sort of link up. You you come across very very uh, um, yeah I, I, I yeah I guess I am a bit dyslexic and that affects really much more your writing and reading than it does in your talking. Um, so I've always been happy to have a chat about things and I do a column for Fast Bike magazine and I just get the guys to ring me up and do it rather than me write it. I'm not yeah. I'm not the best writer. Hence I got Matt Roberts to join me to do my book because I knew it would be written in a a much finer easily read way. Mm -hmm. um, but I did do my own uh, the narrating for the for the audio book, which I say I have to say I was like in there, and in the end I think it was the last day, 
and this guy, and I've had about enough of it. And he's going, yeah, can you just, I'm going, it's my freaking book. I'll do it all on. And, kind of, and that was the way it went. So you might find if you, if you ever listen to the Parish Times, um, in an audio book, the last couple of chapters, it might you're just kind of grounded it up like yeah, 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 I'm the end. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm off out of here. You know, the first time you got put in a camera, did you think I can? Uh, this is I a always bit of me, felt this, reasonably you know I mean? comfortable, and that's how I actually became a commentator. It was at the British Motorcycle Grand Prix at Silverstone, and I think it was '84. And I'm riding for Mitsui Yamaha, who were the import Yamaha importers, riding a TZ500 Yamaha, and it was still push starts then. And they were horrible things to start the Yamaha. If you didn't sort of just get it right when you stopped it, it would flood what? up. Yeah, yeah. And there I am, flag drops, and I'm running like a lunatic, jump on it, burr, 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 and I get off. Everyone and else run, is burr, 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 And everyone's like you say, going past it. And by now, I am halfway down the pit wall at Silverstone. And they're probably half a lap in front. And I finally just wheeled it to the side, threw it against the pit wall, climbed up on the pit wall, and there's a bloke with a microphone, and his name was Andy Smith, not Andy Smith from Yamaha, from BBC Radio 5 Live or whatever it was. And he said, oh, you must be distraught. And I went into this one. I said, I've been here for four days. We've done everything. I've qualified here. And I, I just came out with this one. He went, that was great. That was so concise. Well done. If ever we want a pundit, do you fancy doing it? And I went, yeah, OK. And that was really how it started. So I started working for radio, BBC Radio. Straight off the bat. I've, like I've actually got the face for it, as you well are aware. <laughs> um, and so I did a couple of the Grand Prix after I'd finished racing with BBC Radio 5 Live. And then got invited to do the tally stuff. Yeah. There we so are. Again, as, as something you must remember, and it's an old saying, when one door shuts, another one opens, but you've got to keep the corridor short. I like that, mate. Yeah. I like that, yeah. mate. Yeah. There you go. It sort of links with that, Cathy. Uh, I could, was born in a barn, so if knee you, corridors, knee out, knee doors. <laughs> if you could go back and give the young Steve Paris that was starting his racing career one bit of advice, what would it be? And that sort of links Shag in. Shag women. You know, but, um, <laughs> as somebody that's you know, had such an illustrious career, spanning lo loads of different disciplines, mm. and somebody who's been successful in every one of them, but has so much to give to the... Like, even now, like you're so enthusiastic, and you... Yeah. Uh, what's, what's the key what's to that What's the success? key to go back? I actually do regret possibly not taking it quite as seriously as I should. I could have done slightly better if I had maybe put a bit more effort into it. And again, if you ever get to hear, we see the Barry, Parish Times book, the forward is done by Barry Sheen and he kindly did it for me shortly before he died, yeah. um, which was a very sad, I was with him when he passed away kind of thing out in Australia. Um, and he, spe he actually wrote the forward and he said, if Steve Parish had spent as much time fixing his bike up and concentrating on his races as he did planning his pranks and jokes he could have been world champion and there's an element of truth in that and i i don't that's quite a big, that's that's a big thing coming from a big man that is yeah it, you know I, I mean i i had i think plenty of natural talent but i'm not sure if i had quite the focus and maybe the 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 determination that was required and I think I was a bit scared because you know sometimes when you don't it's like I don't know if you're good at it if you go and have a game of snooker or a game of golf or things that you're not good at you don't take it very seriously because you're worried that you're going to be shit if you do and I think there was an element in my life where I don't know I just didn't push quite as hard as I should have done and anyway I didn't but I've had a lot of fun doing it let's face it I've, I'm not regretting anything terribly no, no, no. but couple of silly things that I could have done that I didn't um, that maybe would have helped my career a bit more because it's that is an interesting point because you're talking about like you're, the way I see it you're in the 1% club mm. you know what I mean we're mm. talking about a niche market where we're mm. talking a small pond mm. you know, we're talking like a small yeah. pond and you're trying to get into that 1% you have made I, I a got life for yourself it. out the sport yeah, and it's but I didn't I wasn't confident enough I think probably you could add it to the fact that I I've got on my bike at the start of the Grand Prix and I thought I looked at Kenny Roberts and Barry Sheen and I was beaten before I started to a certain extent. Um, some people, and I think Carl Fogarty's like that, he always got on his bike thinking he was going to win. The reason I didn't think I was going to win because I would be too disappointed if I didn't. Do you know that's a negative side to things and that's probably how I went about it. I would rather think I'm going to finish third, finish second and be overjoyed with it and I would finish first, 
think I was going to finish first and finish in second and then be distraught by it. Mm. Totally agree. That was just how I went about my life. Really, inter- it, really that, interesting that's topic a very, when that, you think about it because there's if you look at the sport, there's some people that always look like uh, pissed, uh, like they'll be you know doing relatively well, but mm. because they want the source you know focused on the winning, mm. might be sort of seconds and thirds, but they're, they're not enjoying it at all and yeah. they're, they're like really yeah. angry at themselves. Yeah. And there's yeah. people that sort like yourself, yeah. like yourself yeah, yeah. that. And yeah. but in in the grand scheme of things of life, mm. what would you, you what would you rather have? you know 40 years of feeling yeah I, I think so being happy with you what you're doing happy with your lot i guess you say um and i am i have been very happy with my lot i think um low expectations will always give you a happy life won't they i've always um uh, try though no no no, no, no i've always found it. that uh, on a night out you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> i used to get them as well <laughs> No, but that, that's, a very, that's a very honest answer. I like that. You know, I, I, I can really Anything's that. a bonus. Like Anything's yeah, it a bonus. is. And, and, you know, you have to be happy with your lot. It's a, yeah, like you say, you wouldn't, that, it wouldn't take a tide out, that thing. Count your blessings. A uh, uh, final one from the patrons. We've got Tony Rolls. I've heard rumours about Avgas and a toilet block, but never heard the full story. Please elaborate. Has there been an, a point in... Oh, this is another one. Have you? Has there been a point in your career you've thought... Uh, I've covered that one about... Mm. Um, yeah, we've covered that one. We'll go with the uh, Avgas story. Do you yeah, know, well, what, do, do, do you know that, what Avgas is? Yes, I do. Thank yeah. God, right, good. <laughs> he does not know yes, anything it's, about it. It's, 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 um, I use it a lot in air. It goes in aeroplane. And, and a tip for everyone is that pump fuel is so bad these days, you want to look at something better than that because it will just ruin your bike and engine. That's because they put so much ethanol in it. Uh, actually, I'm involved in a company called Classic Fuel Solutions, so that's sponsor, where you should be going. They, they, they sponsor, they yeah, sponsor my great team, product. Race World. Great really product, good, yeah, like really that. good product. Because unfortunately, pump fuel nowadays is getting worse and worse because of the, the ethanol they put in it, which they have to do by law. So watch out for that. But yes, uh, it was Tony, wasn't it, that asked yeah, that question? Tony, Tony, you need to go and buy my book, Tony. But yeah. no, <laughs> there was um, there was an issue in the fact that, and again, this is Barry Sheen that got me into trouble, in the fact that I'd been to Finland. He'd been to Finland to race at Imatra for probably three or four years. And every time he went back to Imatra, the paddock was in their athletics track in the town of Imatra, which was right up on the Russian border. And it had this beautiful lake right beside it. So we would travel from the Swedish Grand Prix to Finland as early as we could to get to this lovely lake where you could go swimming and things like that. It was beautiful, clear water, but they made you wear a hat to go in the water. So we would get up there. On top of that, Finland was full of the most gorgeous, long-legged blonde ladies you can imagine. So that hence you'd get to Finland as quick as you possibly could. <laughs> One of the downsides of Finland was, uh, and Barry had noted this for a number of years, the toilet block was completely inadequate because it was designed for 10 people running around a, ro- a, a cycle track type, athletics track. All of a sudden there'd be 300 motorcycle riders turning up sidecar back in the days it was sidecar class 50 cc 125 253 55 100. so six classes of bikes with fifth grids of 50 you know so there was a lot of people in the paddock and finland track was very dangerous it was tree lined it was got railway crossing so there was 300 people in the paddock wanting to shit themselves before they went out so the toilet block was completely overwhelmed <laughs> at the end of 1977 my first year there Barry finished behind me, actually. I got fifth and he was sixth. He had a bit of a problem with the bike, but he clinched the 77 World Championship at Finland. So it was going to be a big, big night out. Before we go out, Stavros, it was, I've had enough of this bloody toilet block here. Let's get rid of it. So he said, um, get that five gallons, five gallons of Avgas left over in my awning, I think, or something like that. He said, we'll sort this flipping toilet block out. So off we go, <laughs> wander across towards it. We get within 100 metres of it and he stops. He says, right. I'll keep guard, you head off and dip this have gas in the toilet block. So I'm banging on the doors, making sure there was no one in there. Sure enough, there wasn't anyone in there because they're all folding up their awnings and tents and everything else to pack up and go home. So I just tipped all this have gas all around everywhere, left a trail of it like a fuse all the way back to where he was with his gall wires on and his lighter and everything else. Checked no one was looking, lit the flipping fuse as such, and sure enough, it went shh, boom. The whole toilet block blew itself to bits because we neither of us realised that it was a methane gas issue in there because it was full of poo. poo. So the Essentially whole a nuclear device. Yeah, up. the whole toilet block, the roof, wooden building, the roof blows off, flies across the paddock and ends up in the lake. You have to wear a cap to go swimming in. Can you imagine? The burning shit house roof is in the lake, and bits of pieces of this toilet block have just exploded everywhere. Let we thought we would be legends for blowing up the toilet block by all the riders, 
but a number of them were not at all happy because they're just in the middle of folding their awnings up as they get rained on by a shite that's <laughs> flying across the paddock. And this was, it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. I got so told off by, it was Jon Eckerold, Tom Heron and all that lot who were just in the middle of folding their awnings up as the whole paddock got sprayed in shite as the toilet block flew across the top. Mm. That is mint. <laughs> So the police came, security came, you name it. What, at what point did the novelty, like, you know, at what point did you think this is actually funny now? I bet it was a few years of going, well, we oh, had to, I can't believe this. Yeah, like. We had to creep off of it and everything else. But the good news is Barry didn't go back in 78, I did, and there was a brand new toilet block. <laughs> so who I, was the I, winner? I, so I feel that with, I was, with a plaque. Yeah, it should have a plaque on it. Yeah, this was the, the cause of Sheen and Parrish well, blowing that, it to bits. You've got to put that on your Twitter feed. I want you to drive back there and put your own plaque Little on the shit. Yeah, that, that's yeah, it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. When in, shit in, in fans. memory of in memory Steve of, Barish, yeah. like Barry mm. Sheen, yeah. you should do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I tell you what, before we wrap things up, my uh, my f uh, my final sort of question really is: um, Have you got anything left on the on the bucket list? Is there anything that uh, you sort of see? Uh, oh, I, you know, I'll be honest with you: um, bucket lists go when you get my age because you can't physically do some of the things you'd really like to do my bucket list is enjoy what I'm doing for as long as I possibly can meet nice people stay in a sport that I love um, and be happy and I'm fortunate that I've you know done okay for myself I've got a nice holiday house in Mallorca and a boat out there I go out there and enjoy that I ride old classic motorbikes that people supply for me I go to nice events and do great things but I mean I could arguably say I'd love to do the Paris Dakar I'd like to do this like to I can't you know physically I'm afraid there comes a time in your life when your body won't do what you want it to do mm -hmm. um, I'm still reasonably fit I play tennis twice a week I play golf and do these things but I'm still living the dream, meeting nice people and having a good time. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. I think that is the perfect way to tidy this up, this show. Honestly, thank you. It's been a so, pleasure. No, no, it's well, been up. I've and really congratulations been. on you guys, getting off your ass, doing something that's nice. You've got a lovely studio in here. Um, a lot of people will be sitting around moaning because this isn't happening, that isn't happening. This is an opportunity for you to go on and do other things. Yeah, no, well, I appreciate fine. that. Yeah, and uh, for me, all the time that I've been into racing, you've been a you've been a figure you're on TV and uh, at various things, and uh, it's been so nice to meet you. And uh, I've been a sex symbol because that's number plate. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but a huge thank you to our sponsors, Colchester Kawasaki, all of our patrons, and obviously Dom's out racing at Scarborough tomorrow. By the time this podcast goes out, it's like next week. So hopefully. You'll You'll have, have a had... big fat trophy sat on this table yeah, next exactly. week. Oh, God. Oh, no. oh, God. Not the way the day has gone, but teeth and problems with new bikes. But anyway, Be yeah. best of luck with that. We've yeah. also got uh, some new hats coming out, and I'm going to run a little uh, competition. <laughs> so if you co comment on this YouTube video, uh, we'll give one of our new hats away. So, and uh, just before okay. you go, you need uh, um, any of your plugs for. Have you got a well, website? Uh, yeah. The Mad Tours will be coming up. There's a mad, madtour.co.uk. He's got the dates on of the tours coming up. Anyone that wants to know anything, buy the Steve Parrish book and if you buy it from steveparrishracing.com it gets signed and personalised for you but that's it really and if you would like to send me any links you've got when this show is about to go out I'll do my best on my social media to awesome. give it a good plug really Absolutely appreciate awesome. that thank thank you very much. thanks so much and uh, look Pleasure. forward to catching yeah, up yeah and well done too. congratulations on you two for getting off your ass and doing this thank you cheers, cheers. thank you very much take care goodbye <laughs> <laughs> click buy deliver with remote purchasing from the two time motorcycle news dealer of the year Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing.